All right, so hi everyone. Welcome back to another session of Ecosystems. But first of all, how was today? You guys can just type in the chat. So, where are the sessions today for you? Oh, Natara, Natari, why, why weren't the sessions not so good for you? Great, Daniel. Nice to hear that. Okay, all right. So is that okay? Do I just do it like that anyway? Yeah, you can do it like that. I'll I'll pick it I'll pick all the answers. That's fine. No pressure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're just going to do a recap. So remember in our last session we were discussing the two main things that make up an ecosystem and what were those things? Anyone? Right, so the abiotic and the biotic factors. So those two things make up an ecosystem. And Natari, you're not wrong. Um, the producers, they do make up the ecosystem. They make up the living component of the ecosystem. So a producer would be an example of a biotic um, component or a biotic factor in the ecosystem. So I just, a point I forgot to mention yesterday. So you remember when we were looking, we were discussing about the forest ecosystem. And if it is that we zoom in on a micro ecosystem, such as um, ants, you know, that can actually be called, you know, micro ecosystems, the proper term or the correct term that should be used to describe them is a community. So when you guys are doing scientific sampling methods, you'll be exposed to what a population is, what a community is, and what a larger ecosystem is. So usually um, the more advanced scientific definition of an ecosystem is a collection of population interacting with abiotic components of in an environment. I hope that wasn't um, too confusing, but I'll repeat it. So a very advanced definition of ecosystems is a collection of populations or a group of populations in interacting with abiotic components in an environment. So what populations are in scientific terms is um, a group of the same species. So for example, you guys know the scientific name for human beings, Homo sapiens, you're familiar with that, right? So human beings would be one population. And then ants 
is that something definitely separate, they would make up a different population. And probably like a group of cats would make up a different population. So that is what they mean. So it is a, it's a group or just a space with different species of living organisms interacting with abiotic um, factors in an environment and that's what make up an ecosystem. And ecosystems are everywhere. So when you think of the following, forests, ocean, neighborhood, you know why they're ecosystems, right? Because they have the biotic factors, they're trees, they're fishes, they are um, human beings, they are buildings, they are coral reefs, there is sand, there is water, there is sunlight, all of those different factors come together to create the ecosystem right it's just a living space so when you're defining ecosystems be sure to use the vocabulary abiotic and biotic you know and if you want to explain what it means especially say um you go back to school in september and your teacher asks you to define ecosystems you can write the explanation for what biotic and abiotic means. Um, and if you're explaining to a classmate, they might not know what they mean. So sometimes when you're explaining, you might want to say, you know, the biotic factors in bracket, the living components, and the abiotic factors in brackets, the non-living components. So now we're going to talk about relationships. And we know that relationships are very important in ecosystems. The number and distribution of organisms in an ecosystem is limited by the availability of energy and the ability of the ecosystem to recycle matter. So the feeding relationships among living things in an ecosystem can be portrayed in complex models called food webs. And I remember asking you guys yesterday if you know what food webs are and food chains and you guys said that and you're familiar with the term you guys know it so basically what this is saying is feeding relationships are very important in ecosystems the fact that the fish eats either phytoplankton or zooplankton which are microorganisms the fact that they eat those those tiny organisms um, is an important relationship that exists in the ecosystem. Think about it this way. What if we have 10 fish and only two, two small microorganisms? How will all of the fish survive? Because though you need food to survive, if the fish can't eat, what will happen? And what will happen to that ecosystem over time? it will die, right. So, oh yes, it will decrease, it will decrease, and it will, I mean, Natari just hit it on the nail right there when, when he said that it will die because over time it will become extinct, non-existent. So this is the reason why relationships are so important in ecosystems. And this is how the abiotic factors can manage the population in a sense. The, the abiotic factors play a very important role in the distribution of organisms. So for example, when you look at plants, what, do, what does um, plants need the most to survive? Or you can list two things that they need to survive. They need sunlight, they need water, Right, they definitely need sun, water, and carbon dioxide. So if plants, so you won't find plants in an area where there's no sunlight. You won't find plants in an area where they cannot get water. Unless they're adapted to live in that area, you will not find them. And yes, um, there are plants and animal species that are adapted to live in extreme conditions. And what I mean by extreme conditions is conditions where it is that their requirements 
for living is is limited the requirement for living is limited but they can survive and a cactus is a very good example of a plant adapted to live in extreme extremely dry conditions organisms both cooperate and compete in or in e ecosystems the interrelationships and interdependencies that develop between organisms may sustain stable ecosystems for thousands of years so basically what this is saying is organisms within an ecosystem so you'll have the fish you'll have different species of fish you'll also have um other animals such as sea urchins, crustaceans such as crabs, lobsters, queen conch, you'll have sea turtles all in one ecosystem. So some of them might cooperate, meaning that they're not competing for food, they are not interacting on a day-to-day -day basis they're just existing together in harmony or another form of cooperation might be where it is that for example there are fish you guys know what sea urchins are have you seen a sea urchin before they're this black yes okay awesome and they have a lot of spikes so sea urchins provide protection for fish do you guys you know um the fish that come in to find the nemo the same <laughs> the same nemo looking fish so that fish that fish actually exists and what the, that fish does is that they actually find protection in the spikes of the sea urchin so in order to find an actual nemo just look if you see a sea urchin and you will actually find a Nemo between the spikes of the sea urchin seeking um, protection from predators. And you know, predators would be like the bigger fish, sharks. And so, you know, that is a relationship. That is a very important relationship that exists in the marine ecosystem. Why would that be an important relationship? Because if they if the fish didn't have somewhere to hide from predators what would happen to the fish they would die out and yes they are that small <laughs> yeah some of them that are that small of course some of them uh they get bigger and when they get bigger they try to find and relief in coral reefs and we know what coral reefs are so they will hide in the crevice of coral reefs in fact a lot of fish a lot of fish try to hide in the in the crevice of coral reefs so that is why coral reefs are also so important not only do they provide um, a place for the fish to be protected from predation but they also provide food for the fish so the algae that grow on top of the coral reef, the fish will often feed off that algae. And yes, oxygen as well. All right, so. And as it regards to interdependencies, the examples used would be um, an example of an interdependency because the fish would be somewhat dependent on that sea urchin for the protection. And it would be very important to sustain the population of the, of the fish. So now we're looking at food chains and food webs. So we know, we know that um, basically food chain just shows, just show you how it is that energy is passed from organism to organism. Even though it's food, we know that food um, is basically energy, right? We have to eat to get energy. 
if you don't eat for a long while, you'll find that you're very weak and you cannot um, do anything. And I've literally fainted because I woke up very hungry and I just couldn't get to the kitchen. So you have to ensure that you eat so that you can get energy to do what you need to do. Every living organism need food. Right, and you will get kiwashioka. That is, if it is that you have a deficiency of protein in your diet. So food chain and food web. Do you guys know the difference between the two? Just looking at them, we can tell the difference, right? So for the food chain, you see that it's kind of a linear relationship. So it's linear, and if you're taking notes, or if you have a paper nearby, um, you can write that food chains are linear. They show a linear relationship. Sorry about that. Yeah, they show a very linear relationship as it regards to the, the movement of energy from one system to another. While food webs are more complex in the sense that there might be multiple organisms at the different levels so there might be two producers or one and then there might be several consumers on the same level so this is just a formal definition of producer so the sun is the source of energy in nearly every ecosystem and we know that because the reason why that statement is true is because the sun provides energy to the plant for it to photosynthesize right and at the baseline of every ecosystem there's a plant if you can think of a food chain or a food web without a plant being at the very, 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 very base, then um, you have to think about it a little more because even zooplanktons, they feed on phytoplanktons, which are microorganisms that photosynthesize. Even though they're not plants in the truest sense, they still get their energy from the sun. All right, so this now, we're looking at a formal definition of consumers. So the consumer is basically all the other organisms that feed on a producer or they feed on another consumer. So, and see, it just says that the others, known as consumers, feed on producers and or other consumers. So in this way, energy gets passed from one organism to another. <laughs> okay no problem i'm almost through i think i'm almost through all right so types of consumers so of course you have primary consumer and you have secondary consumer so for primary consumers it would be like the grasshopper in this picture here the grasshopper would easily be a primary consumer because it's the first consumer that would feed on the producer right and then all the consumers after the grasshopper would be known as secondary consumers so they are not feeding directly on the producer but they're feeding on the primary consumer all right and then tertiary consumers would be like the snake now who is feeding on a secondary consumer and then of course you have herbivores and the, another type of um, consumers you have herbivores this is just a different way to categorize the con consumers that exist within a food chain or a food web so you have herbivores that feed on plants only carnivores that feed on meats only and omnivores that feed on plants and animals and then you have decomposers and scavengers 
which are primarily responsible for recycling the nutrients. So by feeding on dead plants on animal life, they break down organic waste material and return essential elements such as nitrogen and phosphorus to the ecosystem. And nitrogen and phosphorus are very important um, for plant growth. So basically these very nutrients are recycled again to encourage the growth of the producer and then it will go through the food chain and the food web again. So this is why ecosystems and the recycling of nutrients are so important. So with that said, what are humans? You can just drop the answer in the chat. In terms of are they herbivores, carnivores or omnivores? And are we primary or secondary consumers? Right, and when we eat vegetables directly from our garden, in that case, we can actually be primary consumers as well. But for the most part, we are secondary consumers. All right, so this is my last slide. I think, I think so. All right, so factors that affect ecosystems. So remember we mentioned um, the fact that abiotic factors play a very important role in our ecosystem. Yes, so new elements, whether abiotic or biotic, tend to disrupt ecosystems when they are introduced. In some cases, a new stable state is realized once species have adopted to the changes in the conditions that surround them. So let me give you an example. Are you guys aware or did you guys hear about the invasion of the lionfish? No? Okay. All right. So there is a fish known as the lionfish that was, it was accidentally introduced in the waters of the Caribbean. It's originally in the, it's originally from the Pacific Ocean but then it made its way across to the Atlantic Ocean and was introduced in Caribbean waters. So this lionfish, a lot of people fear them because they're very, yes, they're, <laughs> they're dangerous. And um, they actually are eating our parrotfish. And you know Jamaicans love parrotfish. Anywhere at all you go in the world, parrotfish, and tropical fish are, are very, um, they're like the most sought of, of the fish. So the lionfish target lo lobsters, parrotfish and other important species that we feed on and so it disrupts our entire ecosystem, our marine ecosystem because now we are seeing where we have a shortage of parrotfish due to the invasion of the lionfish. And there are several other examples where it is that ecosystems can be completely damaged because of an introduction of something new. For example, an abiotic factor such as a chemical being introduced into a river. So later on you'll learn about eutrophication but eutrophication is caused by an influx of nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus in river systems. So if you have a river that is next to a farm and the farmer is fertilizing its crops, his, his or her crops, and the fertilizer ends up going into the river, it will cause whatever plant species that is in the river to overgrow or to grow larger than it usually does and when that happens it can affect the fish that are in the water causing them to lose oxygen not not be able to access oxygen because the plant is using that oxygen to 
So um, instead of the plant providing oxygen, maybe it is that the plant is covering the top of the water and causing below it to become very toxic and stuff like that. So change can lead to ecological collapse and the death of many species. As human populations grow, for instance, and their consumption of food, water, and other materials increases, the ecosystems that provide for these needs are, at the very least, being stressed, and in some cases, they are being destroyed. So that is, I told you this was my last slide. And this is a video that you guys can watch. Um, I already uploaded the material. So you guys can go in and watch that video. And if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Google Classroom or you can send an email directly to our, our email address, biolifeja at gmail.com. And I hope this session was very informative for you. I hope you learned a lot. All right, so see you guys tomorrow. So just two minutes over, or really probably was one. But have a good day, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.